For years, Dillian White has been disrespected, underrated, and falsely accused. Hey guys, this is Boxing's Objective Observer, and welcome back to Ringside Stories, offering you the story so far, the villain's version. As I've stated in past content, I'm not a fan of any fighter in particular. My job is to inform you guys, the boxing fans, to the best of my abilities. So first of all, is Dillian White the best heavyweight in the world? No. Is Dillian White the most avoided heavyweight in the world? No. Do I rate Dillian White? Yes, very much. Just take a look at the body of work, per se, that the body snatcher has put in already. White has fought some very credible opponent of which you've seen a few examples in part one of the villain's version. But let's start from the beginning. Dillian White's career has been far removed from a conventional boxer. In fact, White used to be a kickboxer before he became a boxer. When people talk about the short amateur careers of both Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua, you'll still see some sort of quote-unquote natural progression. For instance, Wilder was a bronze medalist at the 2008 Olympics. AJ went even further, winning gold at the London Olympics in 2012, a year after finishing second at the highly touted World Amateur Championships in Azerbaijan. Both Wilder and Joshua ended their amateur careers under 50 fights, which is a short-lived amateur career, conventionally speaking. Well, Dillian White had an even shorter amateur career. As mentioned, White was a kickboxer and had a dispute with the Amateur Boxing Association of England, or ABA. And that was part of the reason why White chose to become a professional boxer in 2011, with an amateur record of just six fights with six wins, including one win over later rival Anthony Joshua. And it wasn't as if White had a head start over his future rivals either. Take Tyson Fury for example. When Dillian White had his first pro fight in May of 2011, Fury was about to face Derek Chisora for the British and Commonwealth titles. That was Tyson Fury's 15th professional fight. And as mentioned in part two of the villain's version, Dillian White was suspended for abusing an illegal substance which kept the body snatcher out of the ring for two years. So by no means did Dillian White have it easy in the early stages of his boxing career. Did not have a long-winded amateur career, nor the experience that Joshua, Wilder, and Fury had. You might say the body snatcher is still pretty much learning on the job. Now as a pro, White fought two future or former champions, and is about to face the third in Alexander Povetkin. Dillian White fought Anthony Joshua when he was just an undefeated prospect, which is proof of Dillian White's belief in himself. Although he lost that fight, the body snatcher gave the undefeated Olympic gold medalist some problems despite not being at 100%. Adrian and Joshua knew, you know, I mean, even Adrian as well, he said, listen, we knew you had problems with your shoulder anyway. But um, it, it was common knowledge I had problems with my shoulder um, from, from before, for, from a Fort Costa, Brian Minto, you know what I mean? But I still believe I had enough to beat him. And I almost, I almost beat him, you know what I mean? And it was a 50 50 fight up until I got exhausted and my shoulder went and I got caught, you know what I mean? But I said, wait, boxing. That was White answering a question from a reporter not using his injury as an excuse because after the KO loss against Joshua, these were White's words. Yeah, I made a mistake, I got hit with an uppercut uh, and that was it, you know. You know, one, two fights, I'll be back. I'm not going to come back and fight some bum, you know what I mean? I'll come back and have a decent fight just to just shake shake a few things off and then get back, get back on the horse and ride the hell out of it. And so White did bounce back in 2016, winning four out of four fights, including then undefeated Dave Allen and a crowd-pleasing fight with Derek Delboy Chisora by the end of 2016. Note, I personally thought Chisora nicked it, but it was a close and dramatic fight, one of my favorites in all of 2016. Few key takeaways from that Derek Chisora one fight. One, Chisora proved that as long as he is motivated, he can still be a dangerous fighter. Two, that win over Chisora in December of 2016 was a WBC title eliminator. Three, even with the losses to White, Chisora is still a credible opponent. As of the making of today's episode, Derek Chisora is ranked of the WBA, IBF, and WBO. Now to be fair, the body snatcher hasn't taken all offers sent his way. Here are a couple of fights Dillian White has declined. Number one, Kubrat Pulev. In April of 2018, the IBF ordered Dillian White to fight Bulgaria's Kubrat Pulev 
for a final title eliminator for AJ's IBF world title. Now Pulev already was the mandatory challenger with the IBF back in 2017, but pulled out citing a shoulder injury. At the making of today's episode, Pulev is the mandatory challenger for Joshua's IBF title once again. Now to all of the critics who claim Dylan White ducked Kubrat Pulev, keep in mind the following. A. Financially, the fight against Kubra Pulev did not make sense at the time. Sure, the IBF ordered the Pulev versus White fight. They went to purse bits, and neither White's promoter, Eddie Hearn, nor Pulev's promoting outfit at the time, Sauerland's Promotions, won the purse bit. The winner was Epic Sports and Entertainment, headed by former longtime Don King attorney, John Wirt. And they determined Dillian White would only get 25% of the purse which would translate to about $375,000 for fighting Kubrat Pulev. So White turned the Pulev fight down and instead took on former WBO world champion Joseph Parker in a sold out 20,000 seated O2 arena, pocketing 1 million pounds, excluding pay-per-view revenue. Besides, Dillian White at that time was already the number one contender with the WBC, holding the WBC silver title which he won by beating Robert Helenius in October of 2017. So White's intentions were already clear. He wanted to face the then WBC heavyweight world champion Deontay Wilder, a rhetoric that he would underline in early 2018. Listen, Deontay Wilder, where you at? June, where you at Wilder? Let's go! Let's go! Number two, Luis Ortiz. Dillian White also could have had a shot with the WBC because the WBC ordered White versus Ortiz in 2018. Despite multiple rumors and alleged offers thrown around, White has yet to get in the ring with King Kong. Now many detractors criticize White for not taking the Ortiz fight, which the WBC did order as a final title eliminator. And you know what? <laughs> they actually have a point. However, what many detractors fail to mention is the WBC's position in all of this has been questionable to say the least. Yes, White versus Ortiz was ordered by the WBC, but so was White versus Dominic Brazil, who immediately became the WBC mandatory challenger when Tyson Fury declined the immediate rematch with the then WBC champion Deontay Wilder. I propose that we make me and Dylan White for the WBC diamond belt not the interim belt and I'll take care of Dylan White and I'll knock him out within six rounds. I accept the challenge. Thank you very much. I fight Dylan White every day of the week and twice on a Sunday WBC. Make it for the diamond belt not the interim version and you got a deal. Let's get it on! Yes and the WBC also ordered that Fury versus White fight as a final title eliminator. Anyway what final title eliminator has Dominic Brazil fought in order to become mandatory challenger? Most people might not remember this, but Dominic Brazil was only the second mandatory challenger Deontay Wilder faced during his reign as WBC champion. Wilder took on his first mandatory challenger in November of 2017 when he rematched Bermain Stavern, of whom Wilder got the title from a year and a half prior. Since the first fight, Stavern had just one fight which was an unimpressive win over journeyman Derek Rossi. And so, Bermain Stavern came into the Wilder rematch knowing he was out of the ring for the best part of a year and a half. Now I gotta ask this, how come Bermain Stavern got a mandatory shot? How come Stavern did not have to face a final title eliminator to face Deontay Wilder? So yes, Dillian White declined a final title eliminator against Luis Ortiz, yet at the same time done more than both Dominic Brazil and Bermain Stavern, who did not fight a final title eliminator. And on top of that, Dillian White has been the number one contender with the WBC for more than 900 days before becoming the WBC interim titleist. And even now, as the mandatory challenger, it's still unclear when the body snatcher will step into the ring to get his shot at the full-fledged version of the WBC world title. Number three, Anthony Joshua II. After beating Alexander Povetkin in September of 2018, Anthony Joshua is targeting Deontay Wilder for Undisputed April 13th, 2019. 
in Wembley. And when Team Wilder openly declined the undisputed fight, Joshua was desperately looking for a replacement. None of the top contenders accepted the AJ fight, including his rival Dillian White. Now keep in mind, Dillian White came off a great 2018 with three good performances, including a sellout at the O2 Arena as the headliner. Now White was offered an alleged four million pounds by Eddie Hearn, while Tyson Fury was offered 15 million. So if White turned down the AJ2 fight to basically fill in Deontay Wilder's spot, I can see his point. Besides, at the start of 2019, boxing fans were demanding the undisputed title fight. Both Wilder and Joshua did not have any direct mandatory obligations as Tyson Fury did not opt for the immediate rematch with Wilder. So even when Wilder was about to face Dominic Brazil, that fight could have been pushed to the side in order to make the undisputed fight with Anthony Joshua. So the Joshua vs. White rematch could have happened, but it simply wasn't a fight that needed to happen. Even without having faced a reigning champion as of yet, Dillian White has delivered some great performances and has some very credible names on his resume. Nowadays, heavyweights hiding from each other. I don't want to fight you because they're scared of, scared of a loss or something like that. Why, why, why is that? If you're a great fighter, you have a hell on your record because it means that you fight other great fighters. The people who, have, who don't have hell on their record because they ain't fought good fighters. 